Welcome. I'm Stephen Winnick of the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. For many years, we have presented the Homegrown Concert Series featuring the best in folk music and dance from around the world. In the year 2020, because of the global pandemic, we shifted to producing an online video concert series, which we call Homegrown at Home. So now in 2021, this is our second year of Homegrown at Home concerts. We were very happy this year at Folk Alliance International to come across a very accomplished Tibetan artist playing a beautiful showcase, and we decided to invite him to perform in our series as the first Tibetan artist we presented in Homegrown at Home. Now, one challenge I have in doing these interviews is pronouncing the names of people from a wide variety of cultures. So rather than introducing him, may I ask you to introduce yourself by telling our viewers your name? Hi, Steve. Um, I'm Tenzin Chogel, a Tibetan artist now living in Australia. Um, I've been living in Australia since 1997. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and since then, I've been practicing my art form and presenting it to many different places uh, in the freedom of exile. Um, yeah, so um, wonderful. So, how are things going for you in the in the pandemic recovery right now? <laughs> right now, I'm in uh, hotel quarantine. <laughs> yeah, that's what we heard. Yeah. So right now, I'm in hotel quarantine in my sixth day um in brisbane and that, yeah and that's mainly because of travel right you were touring. yeah 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 so just last month i went to uh, scotland uh cope 26 to present mm -hmm. um to present a concert with the pathway to paris um at the opening day of the uh climate change conference wow. and then because of the pandemic i had to um make my way home which took about three weeks, even though <laughs> the, 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 the program that I had in Glasgow was for, for five days, mm -hmm. but then I had to come around. And then now, now that I'm home, actually 10 kilometers away from my home, but right. I'm, I'm actually uh, in the hotel and, um, it's not bad actually, but then, yeah, yeah it's it's just actually um it's a little challenge in terms of you know like how i think it's about how you approach it mm -hmm. and um you know you could make use of the time that you are spending in the hotel as being in a cave um, right you know or you can totally um whinge about it so which one would you prefer so like yeah so i'm i'm, I'm actually um kind of taking it in as a each day i'm like actually maybe library of Con um, congress might enjoy it too I've, each day what I, the, the way i've been spending the day is researching on one or two little stories from tibet those who have, you know, like like the Milarepa, the story of Milarepa, mm -hmm. the great poet, the great saint of Tibet, um, the story of Milarepa. So, um, just the other day, I was reading about a little story of him. <laughs> and, uh, Interesting. Yeah. Well, that's a good that's a good way to spend the time. Certainly, doing doing research, and now that that so much is online, it's so yeah. much easier to do that kind of thing from your hotel, of course. Yeah, and hotel itself is, um, I mean, occasionally, only thing that I didn't really like is I can't hear any sound, outside sound, other than um, the air conditioner. Right. So there's a constant buzz of the air conditioner sound. Yeah. And I can see the rain and birds flying outside the window and I... I, actually, the birds are flying so close to the window, I uh, still can't hear them, or I can I can see the droplets of the rain, but right. I can't hear them. Um, but strange, I, strange for a musician, certainly, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, but then, you know, like I can, because of the 21st century technology, 
at least I can call friends and hear them through my uh, video contraption or the yeah. <laughs> sure yeah. yeah so to begin talking about the background of your music of course the Tibetan culture is ancient and complex and unique in the world what do you think is most important for us to know as background to your music um the the background of my music is purely um rooted in the lineage of tibetan nomads mm -hmm. um the sound that you like the sound that i produce um, the essence of my sound actually is in the lineage of Tibetan nomads because my parents were nomads and my dad was uh, like both of them were from the nomadic family and um, I grew up uh, as a child I grew up uh, listening to them uh, especially my mom she had a very beautiful voice and um, so I would say actually my parents uh, are the uh, most um, like they have kind of passed on their wisdom of sound mm -hmm. in directly or indirectly they have passed on to me yeah so you mentioned the nomadic culture the nomadic background of your culture um explain a little bit about the nom nomadism about how that's important to the music uh, um, I think the way, you know, in those days, I think the music has been an integral part of the life. Mm -hmm. You know, like these, these songs would come from one village to another village, and those songs would contain uh, what has gone in that, uh, the, in the previous village uh, or you know, songs were the carriers of the news as well as well mm -hmm. as uh, the stories that are happening so uh, in that way and then also the songs were also um, about inspiring um, beings to become an enlightened being like like the songs from Melaripa mm -hmm. you know like um, the Melaripa songs are actually um about how like the nature of all phenomena you know mm -hmm. and then actually teaching it's actually the teaching of the core essence of the buddhism but yet it's like sung in a very spontaneous gesture so um and i would say milarepa is a nomad you know like he would wander from one place to another singing his um um what is that called singing his spontaneous thoughts mm -hmm. that the beings needed to hear at that point of time yeah. well since you've been researching his story lately uh tell us a little about milarepa since that's uh, you know part of what's on your mind right now <laughs> I think it's, uh, uh, um i think milarepa yesterday i wrote i i wrote a little piece um I think Milarepa's songs were like the, you know, like like the young uh, uh, Yamdo, uh, what is that? Zangbo, uh, Yalun Zangbo, the Barmaputra. Mm -hmm. You know, the river Barmaputra. Before it comes into um, India, it is called Yalun Zangbo in Tibet. Oh, interesting. Okay. And um, and I think the way the Yalung Sangbo curves and like ingrains these patterns in the gigantic mountains, mm -hmm. the Himalayan mountains, the gorges that it makes. Similarly, I think Milarepa's songs have done that in many beings' mind, mm -hmm. minds of many uh, beings you know like has curved around and made all these beautiful patterns and inspired all these beings and uh, there was one story that i read a couple of days ago and you know miller but he you, 
Do, do you know about you know about Milarepa? Yeah. I don't know much. I just I know the name and a, a basic you know it, essence. So if you want to explain uh, more, please do. Yeah. Um. You know when when he was meditating in his caves, um, he used to he used to make uh, soup out of nettle. Mm -hmm. uh, the these uh, stinking nettles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The tip of these things. The tip leaves of the stinking nettles, they make a really beautiful soup. Mm -hmm. um, and so as he one day as he was, you know, going to make his he needed uh, cook his soup, he needed to collect, he needed to go out and collect uh, firewood. Mm -hmm. So as he went out to he left his cave and as he went out to collect his firewood, and after a while he came back and as he came back, he sees that his whole cave was like taken over by demons. And um, so, so, and as he saw all these demons um, and demoness has taken over the cave, um, then what happened is he quickly rises to the occasion and says, mm -hmm. Okay, I need all these demons out of my cave, but how can I do that? So he starts teaching them about nature of things and about the experience of existence and non-existence and love and compassion and all this. And as soon as he, so he sat on his um, meditating meditation cushion mm -hmm. in the space that he normally meditates, and starts giving teachings to them. As he started giving teachings to them about the non-existence and the nature nature of all phenomena and, and all this, like one by one, all these demons start started disappearing and dissolve into the space. And as it dissolved into the space, there was one demon that with his fangs coming out and his nails like like uh, yeah and all like super proudly stood steadfast in front of him and not going to go anywhere and so he was thinking so miller ever thought how like i have done all all the ways like all the ways whatever i can to shoo them away and but but this particular demon is like steadfast and the particular demon which has super boasting eye written on him <laughs> and so so he stood steadfast and as soon as and then Mirabur just thought okay there's no way i can get rid of this guy so how about i offer myself to this demon and and maybe that that's the way maybe he will go away so this so mirareba just goes in front of his mouth this like with the fangs and his mouth offers his himself his whole body in front of him and says eat me if you wish <laughs> and as soon as he offered himself to this giant of a um, demon, the demon disappeared and dissolved into the space. So in a way, like, the, <laughs> I know it's like a really, uh, what is that called? Uh, kind of a story about demon and Milarepa and all this. I think it's all the, like, I think the story is about Milarepa dealing with his own demons. Sure. Yeah. And in the cave, all these demons were there. And then that particular demon who was super proud of I. So as soon as Milarepa offered himself to that I, then that demon kind of dissolved into the space. So it's kind of like, I think it's a really nicely, like very beautifully woven story, but at the same time, it you know, like you could sing that whole story. Yeah. Like, 
can could you hear a song with that like i think you can sing that whole story but at the same time you know like you can contemplate on all this beautiful like uh, visual like vi i think you could i could even think of visually as well at the same mm -hmm. time the depth of the story as well yeah it is a, a, wonder, a wonderful I, I, story so yeah <laughs> I took you. Oh. Yeah, that's wonderful, though. Thank you. <laughs> it sort of reminds me. It sort of reminds me of you in your hotel room too, because you mentioned, you know, that it you you can decide what are you going to do with your time in your cave, you know, and that's yeah. sort of similar to what the, the decision that Milarepa has to make there. So yes. wonderful. Thank you for the story. So, oh, wow. yeah. So so one thing that I think uh, must be at least part of the the background to to most uh tibetan people's lives these days is the diasporic experience that is so many tibetans are either um living as refugees in india or settled in india or settled in australia as you have or the us mm -hmm. or other places um talk about the 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 diaspora experience a little bit and how that has affected tibetan culture if you could uh, no. Um, the Tibetan diaspora kind of, um, I mean, we are kind of, of elder generations were very um, amazing beings. They were, we were put from like a, a free living country and put into an exile in a span of like a very short time. Yeah. in 1959, like particularly 1959 when Tibet came into exile. A um, lot of our elders were able to adapt into the world, which is totally modern for them. I mean, a lot of our elders wouldn't have seen electricity, uh, like especially my parents who mm -hmm. were living as nomads, wouldn't have seen any uh, modern technology. Uh, I mean, as for me, I, I saw the electricity when I um, came into Nepal, um, uh, like, so in that way, I think we were able to adapt uh, into the world that we were, like, dropped in from one universe to another universe. We were dropped in like that because yeah. of the Chinese communist regime, uh, annexation of Tibet. And um, um, so... I think early on, Tibetans, they had only the sky and the earth as their friend, but then slowly the whole world started to friend them and uh, we were able to, uh, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama and his generation, mm -hmm. which is my parents' generation, um, like started a whole um, school system. And uh, because of that, uh, like my generation and the generation now are able to get education, which is supported by a lot of the people out, like probably like, um, like organizations like Library of Congress or, you know, like um, or really many non governmental organizations mm -hmm. that have supported the school system that is in exile. And I came from a Tibetan. I went to Tibetan Children's Village School, which is in Dharamsala, mm -hmm. which was run by the um, younger sister of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And uh, I mean, living in those um, boarding schools had its own beauty. At the same time, it's got its own because uh, you you can't you don't get to spend your time with your parents, right? Uh, because you spent like whole 13 years in that boarding school. Yeah. Uh, occasionally, like one or two months a year, you get to see your parents or any other siblings. Um, but then you end up acquiring this giant of a family. Mm -hmm. um, and now when I go around the globe, like in if I come to Washington DC or New York or San Francisco or Japan, or Europe, there is this, those who have gone through that Tibetan Children's Village School, 
So actually, I can call one of them up and say, "Hey, can I come in?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so we've got like a huge, big family. Um, till date, that school has given education. Tibetan Children's Village has given education to fifty, more than fifty thousand kids. Yeah. Wow. So. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a very large family. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you could kind of like. I mean, I don't know. All of the fifty thousand, right? <laughs> but at least I know during my time, I think there would have been at least thirty uh, three thousand yeah. children who have gone through, grew up with me. Yeah, I know quite a lot of them, and it's always nice. Like whenever I do go around doing concerts in like pockets of the globe, like little pockets of the globe around, and I see see my family like. Um, that school family. So the diaspora, Tibetan diaspora, is like that. It's scattered. Right. So what I what I mean to say is, just as example of the Tibetan Children's Village School example, we are all scattered around the globe now. Like the diaspora is scattered around the globe, but um, fortunately, uh, because of the guidance from our elders and the wisdom of His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, that we actually been able to keep the traditions um, intact mm -hmm. with, with moving intact at the same time moving with the time as well you know like yeah. not just stay in stay back in the what is that called? The tradition, but um, um, what's the phrase for that? Like uh, moving forward with the uh, yeah, yeah, to yeah. to sort of innovate within whatever tradition you're you're working with. Yeah. yeah, it's very important because otherwise the tradition will just you know will never change and will be boring to people after a while. So yeah, it's very important to be able to create, be be yeah. creative within the tradition. I think one so, this, for this one, I think Philip Glass said very something very in, uh, very interesting. He said, you know, if if you don't know something, then it means that you are doing something new. Mm -hmm. So you know, like so, yeah. I think you know, I think when when I'm actually creating, I really enjoyed the uh, the space that space that is given where you don't know anything yeah but then at the same time you have something to fall back to because you carry the stories of all these thousand beings that has gone before you mm -hmm. so you have that at the same time you when you don't know what is going to happen next then yeah. it's very like it's super yeah. awesome <laughs> that's great so, so was it there at the village school that you started to learn music? Were you, did you learn your instruments and singing at, at that time, or was it later? Um, that at school there was um, uh, what's that called? Music uh, school, music mm -hmm. classes, and uh, but then I wasn't, you know, like the kid that is considered well good at music, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, and uh, but then I had affiliation with singing since I was very little. Like when I look back at, you know, I think those these days, you know, like the, the you know, what we have, the Facebook. Yeah. Those days, I think we had actually a book book where yeah. we put our, like we exchange our thoughts with the classmates. And uh, when I was in, since I was in grade six, um since then i think we in that in that book we we have to write your name uh, what you want to be in the future and uh, what your hobbies are and all these things mm -hmm. so in that book since grade 5 till grade 10 or 11 or something where it says my aim i have written like a singer slash english teacher <laughs> <laughs> So even though I wasn't considered um, like uh, what is that called 
a well um, musically talented in school, but I had, I think I had this aspiration to to do that uh, in in a voice that was probably already there, mm-hmm. and uh, and then my school, um, my brother is a trained opera teacher, opera master, mm-hmm. my and my mum was already. Like even though she is not a trained musician or anything, I really actually credit my mom and my dad. Um, even though they were not trained or anything, but they they like they loved singing and playing mm-hmm. music, um, and that karmic imprint of hearing them as a toddler, I think, uh, has given a given that aspiration. I think. Mm-hmm. And specifically, the instruments that you play. Where did you Where did you learn them? Oh, the drangin. <laughs> the drangin is a string instrument. The mm-hmm. three three string instrument. I started playing that in school, mm-hmm. but then I particularly started playing more often um, in um, when I started working as a shopkeeper for Tibetan Institute of Performing Arts, where my brother was a, a teacher there. And uh, with the with the lingbu, the flute, um, mm. lingbu, it was more of a my my dad used to play that flute, that that um, and the sound of him play like um, as I remember, um, even though I can't remember his face, but I do remember him. Like he passed away when I was uh, young, like mm. little. So, but I remember when I look back and try to visualize him, I can only visualize him playing flute with long hair, yeah. um, quite uh, uh, like well built. Uh, but I can't picture his face. Yeah. But then I can hear him play the flute, so I think that's karmic imprint of that. That and then uh, over the years, I have met many friends who play flute beautifully. So I have, you know, like it's it's. I didn't have a I didn't have a particular teacher, but it's you know like hearing. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like a taught through listening yeah. yeah yeah makes sense yeah so how did it come about that you moved to australia uh finally after being raised in india uh my uh my wife is bronwyn richards mm-hmm. and she came to australia in 95 and um no not to australia <laughs> to india in ni- 1995 where i was um, in Dramsala, mm-hmm. and she came there as a um, Australian volunteer abroad. So she was actually volunteering as an English teacher at the Tibetan Institute of Performing Arts. And uh, there I met her, and and then um, yeah, this is like uh, the story is still going on. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, that that sounds like a good story. So I'm glad to hear that. And yeah. so so moving to Australia, you ended up um, being able to collaborate with all different types of musicians. Um, you weren't surrounded by only a Tibetan community or or um, you know a, a, a sort of small village community. You were in uh, cities and with a lot of different kinds of people from all over the world. So talk a little bit about your your collaborations. Um, I mean, the one people are likely to know is Tibet to Timbuktu. Um, yeah. Talk talk about that group a little bit, if you would. Uh, um, my collaboration has been probably the key in uh, knowing, like, expanding my uh, knowledge of uh, music, and um, and I'm a, I'm a very keen uh, collaborator with. Um, huge space for improvisation. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so coming to Australia, it has opened, like the space that I am in, in Brisbane, 
it's a very beautiful community of uh, artists where the artists they get together uh, quite often and uh, we like um, and many different genres of artists so that's how I uh, came about working mm -hmm. with Tibet to Timbuktu. Tibet to Timbuktu is actually the core three members are a guitarist Marcello Milani and uh, Shen Flindell and myself, mm -hmm. uh, Shen Flindell on tabla. And then we have lots of guest artists like Richard Grantham, um, Catherine Philp, mm -hmm. and many, many different genres. So in my collaboration of the years, I have collaborated with um, my Aboriginal friends on uh, didgeridoo or yakida, um, and then um, uh, from that to classical world of uh, f like with Philip Glass on with him collaborating on uh, writing scores for films mm -hmm. and then um, uh, occasionally I have even collaborated with punk music and stuff right. so it doesn't it doesn't like for me music is music is like like the drifting cloud in the sky mm -hmm. which it, which doesn't um, where uh, it doesn't bother it's not bothered about the geographical boundaries that are created by human beings and I think language a lot of the time I think um, um, yeah like uh, musical language has no boundary yeah yeah and, uh, and it's very really beautiful in that way. Yeah, well, so one thing that I think a lot of people might be really interested in is that you've you've been involved in two different projects based on the texts that in the West are often known as the Tibetan Book of the Dead, um, yeah. but of course has a different name in, in Tibetan life. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about, first of all, introduce that text and that, um, that tradition that for, for people. Oh, what do you mean by two different projects? <laughs> well, I was thinking of Triyaka and of songs from the Bardo. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead project has been um, there for, like I've been performing that for last, probably more than 20 years each mm -hmm. year. Um, initially, uh, it's not really a performance. It's more of a meditation mm -hmm. um, on meditation on Tibetan Book of the Dead, which, which actually Tibetan Book of the Dead itself is not an actual translation. It's called Pardo Todo, uh, Liberation Through Hearing. Right. Um, uh, Pardo Todo, yeah. So the Tibetan Book of the Dead is um, popularized by Ivan Wants, who translated the book uh, yeah. with Kamakaze. And um, uh, I guess he took that from the Egyptian Book of the Dead or whichever. The I think so, yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 So actual, like, but that title itself, I think having that kind of title made it very popular in a way. Um, but actual translation is uh, liberation through hearing um, in the between, yeah. So in the intermediate state or mm -hmm. something. So um, for me, um, I started that project with Michael Askill and um, uh, with him, and then we, and then over the years, it has like uh, manifested in different forms. Like it has taken off. It became Tibetan book um, songs from the Pardo. Mm -hmm. It became Pardo songs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then it became, um, yeah, so many, like, but I try to perform it once a year, at least. And uh, with Michael Askill, it um, uh, it started probably 15 years ago. Yeah, and it was like, so, and then a couple of, about five years ago, when I had to do a, presentation in Rubin Museum, 
Mm -hmm. I collaborated with Jesse Perry Smith and Laurie Anderson and Ruben Cordelia. And uh, we presented that song, uh, that performance, I mean, meditation. Mm -hmm. And then we recorded the next day, and that became the songs from the party, which is uh, actually, which is recorded. Uh, and you can find that on Smithsonian label, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think people should know that that was also nominated for a Grammy Award. So it was a highly acclaimed uh, album just last year. So yeah. congratulations uh, on that project, uh, among Thank others. You. But yeah, so, yeah, so that, that one was very beautiful. Like it was very spontaneous. Like especially when we do when we do the performance of that that um, Pardo songs or the songs from the Pardo or um, um, meditation on liberation through hearing on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. The 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 main hero of the performance or the meditation is the text, mm -hmm. which is, um, and then it is illuminated by sounds and given, yeah, so uh, given space for people to contemplate with sound underneath it or in between songs. And yeah, so it's very beautiful. Um, uh, I just did one performance the other, other month in LA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So yeah, so uh, again, you know, recommending for people to to look for for Tenzin's performances on of that project, but also, um, you know, the concert that we had on uh, at the Library of Congress was beautiful and involved some traditional songs and some songs that you composed yourself, of course. So yeah. if you could talk about the relationship a little bit between traditional Tibetan songs and your own songwriting. I think that would be interesting to folks. So I think in the Library of Congress, um, it was quite a, quite a couple of months ago. I think yeah. was it last year? <laughs> yeah, it was sort of mid year. Yeah, so about yeah. a few months ago. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think what I did was I did present it one particular nomad song, which is very uh, like um, in my own way, but it uses the whole lineage of nomad, mm -hmm. the traditional nomadic sound. And then um, and then I took the I took it into where how I would present my my own pieces. Mm -hmm. And then at the end I think I did a piece from the Tibetan book like the songs from the Pardo where there's um, where there's the uh, spoken word where I read the spoken word with the elemental praise. And then um, uh, it's about uh, the safe passage of the consciousness as the consciousness goes from, um, goes from like when all the five elements resolve into each other and then the consciousness leaves. So mm -hmm. where for that, I have, I, I think as if I remember it clearly, I. I can't remember totally clearly since I've done so quite a number of online things. So right. I can't exactly remember, but I think this is what this was the Library of Congress where the final piece was uh, Elemental Prayer Song. Mm -hmm. So I have incorporated as a soloist how I would do, like you could, one could kind of see here the essence of Tibetan nomadic tradition at the same time with like how I have kind of taken it into the modern, the contemporary world that mm -hmm. I'm living in now. Yeah. 